In the name of God, creator, redeemer, and giver of life. Amen. Please be seated. So you want to be in love like the movies, but in the movies they're not in love at all with a twinkle in their eyes they're just saying their lines so we can't be in love like the movies a movie tells a story a great movie draws on our human experience to show us something of ourselves through the stories of the people on screen. And whether that's the big screen or the small screen, we see something of ourselves in these wonderful stories. But even the best movies are still a kind of construction. There's some artifice to it. Anyone who studies film will ask not only how it made you feel, but also how the director selected everything from the actors to the framing of the shots to the position of the lighting and the camera and, and if you're Wes Anderson to things as minute as the color and texture of the shoelaces on the actor's shoes. The problem is that that's movies but that's not life. We cannot create or, cure or curate life in quite the same way that our movies or our songs or, or even our favorite inner dialogue storylines do. We have stories about ourselves and the stories that we tell. And those stories tend to run to extremes. And they run along lines like, everything worked out great. Or, everything was stacked against us. But, but neither of these are, are actually real. Uh, I, I had a, I remember a, an old, a salty old pastoral care mentor. Believe it or not, the grumpy ones tend to be the best. Who who got really upset when someone in our cohort uh, talked about someone whose life had been ruined by by a tragedy. He he got mad and he barked out. He said, "There's there's no such thing as a life that has been ruined, and there's no such thing as a life that is successful. It, it just life just comes out crumbly. That's all. Life just comes out all crumbly." The Avett brothers sing a song that I butchered a little bit at the beginning about love in the movies not being all that it's cracked up to be. Which makes me think just a little bit of, of the Ascension, which we celebrated on Thursday and we're still observing today, where that beautiful story where Jesus concludes his earthly ministry is drawn up uh, into the heavens. A story which for all its beauty carries with it the risk of, of being a storyline that's wrapped up a little bit too perfectly. A as if with, we had credits rolling across the screen as Jesus rises up into heaven. If that's, if that's how we read it, as the perfect cap to the story of Jesus' walk on earth then we are going to get caught off guard when life continues to happen as, as life does. We are going to be caught off guard when we realize that this life of faith has a whole lot more cliffhangers than tight chapter endings. Beloved, Peter writes, or the author of 1 Peter writes, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is taking place among you. As if something strange were happening to you. Now, at its root, this to me is, is deeply supportive for Jesus' companions, his friends who were now moving through life without their friend and companion right there by his side. And they had to, they had to figure out, wait a minute, life is still hard. 
What, what does that mean? And how many of us have been through a fiery ordeal, through hardship and challenges that made us to feel alone and, and perhaps even surrounded? And then asked, what, what's wrong with me? Am I, am I faithful enough? Why is there so much suffering? And why is my heart so heavy within me? And you may have gone so far as to then say, why, why is that hurt still there when my faith and my relationship with Jesus is so important to me? I, I go to church, I give, I study, I pray, I, I, I do all the things. And yet I still feel this ache. I still see great hardship and injustice in the world. Am I, are, we, are, are we doing this wrong? Well, the letter of 1 Peter seems to suggest that if anything, we're doing it right. It shouldn't feel strange that we go through hardship because life is still life. And in fact, there is a reason to rejoice because when we suffer, we share in the suffering of Christ, which means that we share in the incarnational love of Christ. This is a love that is forged by hardship, but it is also forged by companionship and belovedness. That doesn't mean that we need to go out looking for suffering. Um, Richard Rohr says this wonderfully well, which is, you know, we, we experience the great crisis in life. You don't have to go looking for it. It will find you. When we certainly don't need to create it for other people. There is enough drama in this world. But it does mean that we are living real life alongside real life other people whose suffering and whose capacity for healing and love is every bit as real as our own. So we can't be in love like the movies. Because in the movies, they're not in love at all. With a twinkle in their eyes, they're just saying their lines. So we can't be in love like the movies. Suffering and hardship, these are real. So we shouldn't be surprised by it. But there's a deeper message here. And it isn't just about how best to endure when, when times are difficult. Because if we can not only resist that urge to fight or to fly when things get a little bit too real, if we can, move, if we can find the grace to move towards it and experience it and to walk with others when they are going through the wilderness, the wilderness that, that lonely, frightening place, then the, the gift is a greater love, a greater awareness of the grace that infuses our world that we can begin to see when we release our grip on, on the perfect story. And as we do, we start to reorient ourselves. We reorient our whole lives, not around the stories that we've constructed, but around a kind of expansive openness the, at the heart of which we find the mystery of God. We have in this letter a few steps on how we can reorient ourselves, how we can begin to rethink our relationship to God and the world. And our first step is to humble ourselves. When we humble ourselves, taking a downward path away from ego and towards selflessness and self-giving, we see the inverted logic of grace. We begin to let go of our need to be the hero of every story, the star of every single movie, he said with multiple cameras pointing at him. Wait, where did we get that, by the way? Has, have people always thought that way, or is it just in the last few generations when, when we live in this mediated world where suddenly, on a, on a daily, if not hourly basis, we are being reminded, told 
how smart and successful and, and handsome we are or could be if only we just believe or buy the right thing. This hunger for success and recognition is seductive, but it tends to lead to suffering. Now, that's, that's pretty Buddhist, uh, for those of you who are tracking along on that one, which is funny because it's right here in the first letter of Peter. And it's really all over the Gospels that, this, that our desire to, to, be, to be for recognition is seduction, but it leads to suffering, which Peter reminds us shouldn't surprise us. And so instead... We seek ways to cultivate a greater humility so that we can reorient our relationships. Another way that we shift our perspective, and this is actually my favorite one right now, and I'll say why in a moment, is from where we are invited to cast all our anxiety upon God. Isn't that beautiful? All those things that you're carrying. Just let it go. Easier said than done. I know. But pass it on. Let God have it. Let God have it. The reason why that's kind of exciting to me right now is because I learned recently about something called externalization. Externalization. It's, it's when people, and this happens especially among people at a certain developmental stage, and by that I mean teenagers, will approach loving parents because it is safe to do so, they will dump all of their anxieties on their parents in one go. I have some experience. This feels great for the teenager who, um, who released from their burdens walks away singing a song from Beetlejuice the Musical. This does not feel so great for the responsible parent, who is now left with a steaming pile of feelings that they now have to figure out how, what to do with, how to dispose of safely. Now, I learned from, from Dr. Lisa Damore, who was with us with a forum a few weeks ago, a, year, a few years ago, just wrote a wonderful book already on the bestseller list, that this, this is actually really healthy. It's how an adolescent finds a safe outlet to do a little bit of off-gassing, which we all have to do sometimes. But I think it also gives insight into our relationship with God, because in many ways, we, we might do better to think of ourselves as adolescents in that relationship. I mean, the story is that we are the wisened adults, and we have been around the block a few times, uh, and so our relationship with God is kind of at this point sort of a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, kind of thing. But, you know, I, I wonder if, and regardless of where each of us is in terms of chronological time, uh, I think that we may do well to see ourselves as that teenager in relationship with God because we go and we do the, you know, we, we do leave all of our anxieties. And that takes a lot of spiritual courage to actually do it uh, and to step away and say, God is holding this. I don't have to carry every single burden on, on my shoulders. And so suddenly, once again, a kind, of, a kind of reorientation. The story that, that we carry it all, can we let go of that and actually open ourselves up to a deeper and more abiding faith? And when we see ourselves as being in a lifelong process of growth, when we begin to see not just the anxieties, the stresses, the seductions of the moment, and begin to look at the whole spectrum of time, then we really start moving somewhere. Because as the letter says, after we have suffered for a little while, can you believe that? Suffering just for a little while feels like forever to me. God calls us to eternal peace. The suffering, we know it. It feels 
It feels like it is forever. Folks in the wilderness never had any sense of how long it was going to be, and it probably just felt eternal. But this is the promise, that it is just a blip, a passing reality, and that we are called to something far greater. Now in the movies, they always make it look so perfect. In the background, they're always singing the right song. And in the ending, there is always a resolution. But real life is more than just two hours long. So we can't be in love like the movies. We can, though. Be in love with the God of life. The one who walks with their children through hopes and hardships. Who carries the burdens of our anxieties and shares in our joys. Whose story of transcendence and grace lifts us out of our carefully created and curated stories and draws us into the heart of the eternal. 